Hi everybody, I'm Larry Newber. You know, sprint car racing is probably the last true art form left today in motor racing. But is it too bold to call it the greatest show on dirt? Well, few who follow motor racing would refute that claim, that the World of Outlaws, an organization headquartered near Dallas, is anything less. The Outlaws have survived threatened driver boycotts and rival sanctioning bodies to stand as the world's most successful race car group on dirt today. And today on Prime Network, we'll recap their season to date. We'll talk about some of those pluses and maybe a little bit of constructive criticism from the undisputed king of the outlaws. We'll be back. You are in suburban Indianapolis. This is one of the most active race shops in all of America. It's owned by New York State businessman Dick Hammond and operated by his team manager, Galen Fox. Joining us is Steve Kinzer. And Steve, I'm curious, why do men, and occasionally women, drive these dangerous beasts and race them? Well, I think the, the danger and the beast part of it uh, uh, puts the excitement in the sport. And, and uh, maybe that's the reason they do it. Uh, uh, maybe it just goes back to the American grassroots of racing. Let's look at a couple of examples of that danger threat to a sprint car driver's career, let alone his very life. Now, first, we'll look at Jack Howdenchild out of Ohio. This is at the Manzanita Speedway in Phoenix earlier this spring. Now, Steve, what goes through a driver's mind in moments like this? Well, in this situation, the steering brakes and it goes straight into the fence. So, uh, basically, what you got to do is you just got to tighten up your muscles, your neck muscles, and get your arms in, get a good firm grip, and just hang on. Do you really have time to think about all that? Oh yeah, you can, it's amazing how much uh, you can think about in a split second. Uh, uh, like I said, uh, you just the main thing is just getting your neck muscles tightened up and make sure your head don't get outside the car or your arms. All right, next is one of sprint car history's most visually frightening moments. You'll see another Ohio and ironically a schoolboy chum of Howdenchild first flying, then disappearing and exploding in flames. Okay, what happens here, it looks like the black car goes in the corner and the, the wing folds under on the left side. You'll see it right here. When it does, the car goes up the track, comes up in front of the 29 car, over the right rear tar, and over the fence. And then you hang on as much as you can, and uh, just the main thing is to try to keep your conscious. If you get knocked unconscious, get loose, your arms get loose, uh, your head gets loose, and then is when it starts hurting. Despite all those aerial acrobatics, no one was seriously injured in those two events. Now, the sprint car, the modern one, is the safest one in history, Steve, but do you think about crashes like that? Uh, not when I'm in a car driving, no. Uh, sometimes uh, at home, maybe, but n not at the racetrack. Uh, it's, it's, it's a dangerous sport. It's part of it. Uh, myself, I just try to keep myself uh, knowing when I got the track or when to give the track up and try to keep myself away from that situation. If you're a sprint car fan, you probably don't need this documentation. But for the record, Steve Kinzer in 13 outlaw seasons has been the champ 10 times, including the first year back in 1978 and last season. His winning percentage has always hovered around 40, the most remarkable in all of motor racing. So when the season began this year in the desert in February in Arizona, and when everyone noticed that Sammy Swindell from Tennessee and Doug Wolfgang from South Dakota, traditionally Steve's stiffest adversaries were not there, well, things did not bode well for the rest of the troops. Now, Steve, were you and Carl confident? Well, uh, we was coming off the start of the season, just wanted to get off to a good start. Uh, uh, anytime Sammy and Doug is uh, not there racing with you, uh, uh, you know, there's two guys, you, two more guys you don't have to outrun. Uh, uh, we was lucky enough we started the season just right where we left off last fall. We come out with a uh, with a motor program that we had ran last fall, and uh, and and it, and it took off right the way it was. Uh, we didn't have any of our new motors in. Everything was the way it was. Yeah, it worked out well. The year begins in Yuma, Arizona, and Mark Kinzer turns the quick time. But right after that, things turn Steve Kinzer's way. Not Steve Beitler's way. Watch the lumberjack from Washington. He bicycles going into turn number one, almost saves it, but he executes the first crash of the 1991 season. Steve, the traditional four abreast, but with a twist. Well, we put a car out front uh, 
for our troops overseas in the Gulf, and uh, I think just uh, just to show a little support from the from the World of Outlaws and the sprint car racing. It's amazing to find a track like this in the middle of the desert. Well, this was uh, quite a new experience for us too. Uh, uh, a new racetrack. Uh, everything went quite well for a season opener on on all new territory. I was surprised at how well the track held up, considering that it's mostly sand out there. Now, there you are right in the midst of a large number of people. Well, the track did come apart a little bit, but uh, it was able to keep a couple different grooves on the track where you could move around and do passing. Uh, a, a type of track I like to run on. I got tracks uh, that I don't run quite so well on, and some as I do. And this is, this is one where you can move around, and it's got a low groove and, and pass. And, that's the type of tracks I do like. There's a little bit of cushion there. You found it coming around three and four, but you accomplished your goal. You start out the new year with a win. Now, uh, I don't recall doing it for a while, just to be honest with you. Uh, the jet ride was great, and, uh, and the victory here was good. Uh, the only thing that be a little better is maybe if I get a golf game go a little bit, it might be all right. El Centro, down by the Mexican border now. You're going to see Sidney Blanford of Denver get in trouble at about 20 miles an hour, Steve. Well, it looks like we've got a little uh, difference of opinion on who's starting <laughs> where here. A little wheel bumping, 360, and I'm sure they got it all figured out after that. You guys don't like to move, do you? This racetrack is 56 feet below sea level, so if the great flood ever hits, they are in trouble. Now, here is the start of the main event, and there is an altercation up front. What's going to happen here is that Brent Kading out of California is going to get into Steve Beitler, rapidly becoming the star of this show. Several cars come together, watching the outside of the racetrack. Danny Lasoski hits the outside wall pretty hard and does get upside down, but no injuries, and uh, they reshuffle the deck and back to the green flag. Bobby Davis Jr. out front. Well, Bobby uh, starts on the front row, uh, uh, gets out front, leads the race. We get past him here. I think there's a yellow and a restart, which allows him to go back in front, yes. Yeah, that happens frequently in racing. There's a rule that says you go back to the last full completed lap when a yellow flag happens. Okay, we're starting again here. And another car spins together and... It's yes, once too. again, yes, Steve Beitler. Now, uh, Steve has gotten uh, drilled in this particular case by Chris Eichert. He spins and keeps going, gets back into the race. Okay, here we are again, trying to trying to get the lead somehow. Uh, you can see the black groove, would just, it's hard to do, come off, get a hold of a little bit, and allows me to have the inside uh, line going into the corner. So it took a while, but finally Steve Kinzer gets around the season champion from two years ago, and Bobby Davis Jr. will have uh, several more adventures in the early part of the season that will eventually result in him changing rides. Bakersfield, California, a flat quarter mile. It's tight, and Steve, you're involved in the first incident here. Yeah, we're down here fighting for track position, three wide, not enough room for everybody. And particularly for Brent Cady, he comes around. I'm sure he blamed you for the incident, you, him. We go back to green flag, next lap, corner number four. Johnny Herrera crashes into the outside wall very hard. He takes exception with another driver. You'll see him pointing out to Daryl Hannestad here, saying, hey, I think you need remedial driver's education. Well, we're going to go back to green. There is Jimmy Sills on the inside. He was moving up on you. He comes into contact with another Californian. That is Gene Manhire, and he breaks the car. See, there's nothing he can do to save it. Well, the front end's out beneath it. Uh, it's all, all, all but stopping. Finally, Steve, you settle things down, uh, find yourself a home up on the cushion, and win your second consecutive race of the year so far. At San Jose, we had the biggest field of the year, 64 cars. Starting on the pole in the yellow number four, driver whom we haven't seen in that posture all that often from Weedsport, New York, is Craig Keel. Yeah, Craig does a real good job this whole race. Uh, the track's slick, uh, running right around the bottom. He uh, gets a start on me on, a, on a coming off the green. I chase him the whole race. Uh, finally, Blaney gets in and sort of interrupts my uh, little playhouse here for a little bit. and takes away from me. I think I get back down inside of him here. Now watch what happens. Entering corner number three, there's a problem up front involving Keel. There he is in the yellow car going up in the air. He spins all the way around, leaving two cars stopped in the racetrack. He keeps going, comes back and crosses the finish line. And even though he was passed, we go to the last full scored lap, which puts him up front. Now you're ahead of him here, but you can't hold on. Well, he's got the groove again coming off of the corner on the bottom. and. And again, I take a little run at him here in the middle, and it, it, it just does not have enough rubber down to do anything right now. Uh, this is probably as close as I ever get to him right here. Uh. 
It's like running on sheer ice, truly, isn't it? It is for a while. Eventually, it gets rubber down where you can really get sticky, but it never does do it. I think we're into the second night here. Craig had gone on to victory that first night and the second night. You came back, obviously telling the fans, I've won. Annually, upstarts try to join the outlaw trail. Few actually survive. Many frustratingly run out of money, some out of drive. In 1991, a couple of Canadians have joined the Outlaw Trail, Jim Carr and Tony Lutar, both British Columbians. Steve, so far, what have each or one of them shown? Well, I've got to watch uh, Carr run quite a bit, uh, not only this year, but uh, in some previous years up in the Northwest. And he looks like he's got all the potential to stay on the circuit. Uh, let's just hope that we can, he can keep the finances with him and, and continue with us the rest of the year. This is Jim in the blue number 65. Now, Tony Lutar, his fellow British Columbian, is in a yellow number 16. We have not seen Tony pick up the checker flag after a heat race yet. It's got to be tough coming down from Canada. Do they race sprint cars up there? I guess they do. Well, evidently they have some type of sprint car race, and I've, uh, I've only ran in Canada one time my, uh, in my career. Uh, uh, I'm sure they don't get us uh, race as many times as we do, so uh, let's, w let's wish them both uh, all the luck. Uh, uh, not, not only our northern borders, but uh, from Australians to anybody. Now, you drive a long ways to haul all the sprint car races, but can you imagine the closest race being like 1,500 miles away? Well, uh, I'm sure these guys, uh, to stay on the circuit, uh, they'll not even get to see their homes uh, the whole summer. What is the real key to surviving out here? I mean, is it eating hamburgs or sleeping in the back of the truck? Well, it, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely tough. Uh, you know, you, anytime you're in and out of motels and, and trying to keep your equipment uh, uh, in running condition, to keep your tow rigs clean, keep your tow rig running, uh, it's a lot of work for the mechanics and the owners. Uh, the drivers has probably got the easiest end of it. But they all have a long ways to go to this point. That jet ride which Steve referred to in Victory Lane had taken place in the desert just north of the Mexican line in El Centro, California. It's a town that almost straddles the California-Arizona border, the winter home of the Blue Angels. Of course, there happens to be a racetrack there, too. Now, the base commander moonlights on the weekends as a stock car driver, so Steve was welcomed with open arms for a ride in a jet. Good. Super. Releases must be signed, so his wife Dana apprehensively looks on. Well, these forms are just like the ones at races. It's just a formality. Everybody's signed and we've never had to use one. Okay. Right. Uh, the next stage, if you happen to relax at that point, is a blackout. Okay, but that only lasts three to five seconds. I've experienced it. You'll, you'll probably have a couple dreams and uh, feel like you're waking up at home. Okay, Steve, come on up, please. Okay. Just watch your head. The tension uh, builds as Steve on. has been given his flying orders by pilot and lieutenant Ken Switzer. Finally, Steve was about to experience a little more torque than his Carl Kinzer sprint car. From here, the sound and the pictures tell most of the story. Mach 1 is reached almost immediately and G-forces fluctuate wildly, sort of like a ride on a high bank track. There are a lot of similarities between racing and jets. Matter of fact, sprint car races are pretty good training for the skies, when you think about it. What I'd like to give you a chance to is uh, see what it's like to fly in an aircraft upside down, okay? Okay. Something you probably haven't had a chance to do before. Well, most of we get upside down, we're not supposed to be there. Okay, coming upside down. Okay. Here we go. There you go. Yeah. How you doing back there? Oh, I'm all right. <laughs> you see, there really isn't that much difference after all. We'll be back with more of the greatest show on dirt on Prime Network. In 1991, the Outlaws will race on 92 different race days. That's at 37 tracks in 17 states. Absolutely coast to coast, and it seems all points in between sometimes. Now, with one million turnstile customers, that makes this sport the fourth most popular in all of motor racing. Now, one of those tracks in Northern California, Steve Kinzer would just as soon avoid it. Stopped your win streak, didn't it? Yes, it did. Uh, we'd had a tremendous amount of rain. Uh had to get bulldozers to cut paths to get to the track. They scraped the track off, uh, pawed it up on the inside, still rough. Uh, 
what I think was a bad choice between promoters and sanctioning body to even run this race. A lot of people come from uh, many miles to see these races. You guys have hauled across country. Sometimes I guess you have to make those tough decisions. Now this is Johnny Herrera. The track still isn't perfect. Johnny was reasonably fast tonight, but Steve, watch what happens when he goes into turn number three. He gets those big humper tires bouncing and he's trouble. Well, it does on this track. Uh, you, can't, you can't even see on this black dirt how deep the ruts are in this thing. Uh, this is only one of the very few cars that uh, was uncalled for to be tore up this weekend. A smoking Terry McCarl will not cause this crash coming up, but watch what happens when Danny Lasowski lifts the front of his car. He's clipped by Jimmy Sills and goes into a series of flips, but it's not over yet. Well, this is just another incident where the track conditions got a, a tore up a bunch of cars. Uh, here we see Danny trying to scramble to get out of his car, and it just c continues happening all weekend. There you are, Steve, battling with Dave Blaney. You come together, it appears to be a love tap, but it damaged your car. Well, it knocked a, a, tore a birdcage up, knocked a brake line off. I run into the next corner not knowing I had any brakes, and then I run over a car myself and puts me out of the race. Hello, Fred Brownfield, and uh, now that win streak is stopped officially at four. Late, the Buckeye Bullet, Dave Blaney, finds himself in the lead with his brand new national sponsor, Vibron, and he goes on to his first main event win of the year. Steve, your incident in warm-ups the next day. Car gets out of shape. I try to miss him, hit the mud on the inside, and tip it over. And it was going so slow, that must have been so frustrating. Well, you can still get upside down running 30 mile an hour. It's, uh, it's uh, one of those things where the, the weather uh, made a mess for everybody the whole weekend, and it just wasn't a good weekend for me all the way around. On to Saturday night's action. This is in the B-Main. Now watch for the red car moving up on the outside. That is Tim Levine from California, but he gets into Bobby McMahon and puts him upside down. Levine escapes. There's a red flag. We reshuffle the deck, but watch what happens on the ensuing restart. This time, Jason McMillan gets into Levine, and he gets paid back for what he just delivered. Later, here's what the start of the main event sounded like truck is off. Kaufman and McMahon will come boiling off of turn number four. Feature time! Kaufman with a slight jump on the inside. Everybody gambling going down the front chute as they head into the corner. Starting the race on Saturday night, the top four cars from Friday night's preliminary start in the first four spots, uh, which puts Dave Blaney on the pole and Keith Kaufman uh, sets here chasing him. So we continue on this race. As you can see, the track conditions is no better. Boy, it really never did smooth out. Tough going, going through slower traffic. Now, they're working on Steve Beitler. They know him well, but this track makes it difficult to pass anybody. Well, it does. Uh, everybody's trying to run right around a little spot around the bottom. If you get up in the rough stuff, uh, there you see Keith gets back by him. Uh, this race continues like this, and I'm sitting back here just sort of riding this out. I've had all I want this weekend, so... Uh, uh, right here, Blaney's uh, leading the race, and all once, here comes Brett Cady. Now, he started in the back and really starts to move near the end. He does a tremendous job. I mean, I'm one of the bigger guys out here, but uh, that thing just wore me out out there. The car felt good upstairs. I stayed, got up there early, and it wasn't quite as nice, but I didn't have the confidence in the car like I got later. And Steve jumped up there when I drove by him a couple times, and his car wasn't nice. And we were just fortunate enough to keep getting bunched up in traffic and drove right on by all of them. Manzanita in Phoenix is a long half mile with sweeping corners that the outlaws can nearly full throttle. The crash over the wall here deposits drivers either in a junkyard or on an adjacent city street. This is the start of the preliminary night. Uh, as you see, Stevie Smith in the red 77 jumps out into the lead. Uh, looks like he's followed close by Dave Blaney. And they continue to race like this. Steve, uh, Stevie was very strong all weekend long. There you are in the bottom in the white number 11, of course, the familiar number 11, moving into fourth. Uh, Smith looked like at times he was the guy to beat this weekend. Well, he definitely jumped out into the lead. I don't think, I think Dave finally, later on the race, gets around us, uh, Stevie, in some lap traffic. Uh, no, not even lap traffic, it looks like. Uh, however, I'm sitting back here. I think uh, I've got by Joe Gertie at this point. And uh, Dave does go ahead and get the lead here. And I should be, I come into the picture there and uh, I get into second and I think that's the way it finishes. I don't think I ever get any much closer than to Dave and this right here. That's pretty close right here, but uh, close was not good enough. And there is Dave Blaney in victory lane for the second week in a row following a preliminary. This is the heat race. 
with uh, I think earlier we've seen where Jack Hodgehow gets in the wall. Uh, there's Johnny Herrera going on the outside, I think, to take over second. And I think uh, Jack thinks he's got everything going pretty smooth and uh, is just going to ride this heat race out. But little does he know, we come around to here for the white flag, the front end brakes, and straight into the fence again. Is there anything he can do? Can he put the brakes on to put that car into a slide to avoid the head-on? At that point, he gets by the t he gets the brake pedal. Well, that was so quick, he really didn't even get to slow down. Uh, again, we got to go back to where he just sort of hangs on and, and tries to keep himself gathered under the car. Well, he staggered out of the car. He did receive a couple of broken bones. It's never minor, but he will at least race again. Now to the main event, the start, that now familiar red number 77, Stevie Smith Jr. up front. Well, Stevie again, uh, as he did the night before, jumps out of the lead with Joe Gertie running second here. And I, I think I'm running third here at this point. Uh, Stevie runs a super race uh, all the first part of this race. Uh, I chase him for about everything I can. I think we dice back and forth a couple times. Uh, uh, here at this point, he's still got the lead. I come under him. I get the lead here. And uh, again, I, I think there's some more passing going on. I, I go up here high. I get trapped a little bit. Stevie goes right back by. Tenacity certainly is a very important word in the vocabulary of an outlaw. Here is Steve in victory lane about a remarkable got moment. Got into some lap cars there when I got the lead, and uh, there's a couple of them running around there real low, and they just covered me up with a big bunch of hard dirt clods, and uh, actually just about knocked me out there for a second. And at that time, uh, Stevie got back around me, and the time I got my senses back, I had to run him back down. Uh, Steve, how do you collect your senses when you're practically unconscious at 100 and almost 50 miles an hour? Well, you don't collect them. It's just a matter of whether <laughs> they don't knock it out of you, I think. But uh, it all works well. Here is Steve putting a lap on the local hero, Leela McSpadden, in the car owned by the president of the California Racing Association, Frank Lewis. Now, late in the race, watch for an orange car on the outside. He jumps from fifth to second position on this restart, all legal. Well, they got a, they, they started in the corner way early, and Mark just went around the outside. They gave him the whole outside, and he went straight to second and, uh, and hung on to finish there. So uh, it was a good night, not only for myself, but for Mark and, and, and all of Carl Ginsburg's race cars. Return with us now to the days of yesteryear in the good old Wild West. Well, at least the Midwest. The year is 1987, and the track is Santa Fe Park in suburban Illinois, where another couple of teammates and spirits square off. Steve, you've had almost teammates often in the memories of 1987, and these two core sponsored cars must be pretty irreplaceable by now. You'll get beat tonight in a sister gambler chassis by Brad Doty. Brad was later paralyzed in a sprint crash, but he had become one of the elite few capable truly of winning an outlaw race every time out. Well, Brad, uh, he was capable of winning any time he went out, and uh, Brad was just just really getting in, into his prime of racing and, and did a super fine job. And, and probably at most, uh, what I'm going to miss more is uh, missing not being racing with a good friend and quite a driver as he was. As the Outlaws blew into Texas the final weekend of March for three races, the winds of change were beginning. Steve would soon stop winning, and the holy trinity of sprint car racing was back. The man with the world dirt speed record, Sammy Swindell, incidentally it's 141 miles per hour, had begun the season in Winston Cup stock cars, but his team was unhappy. So Sammy returned to the sprinters after all. Doug Wolfgang started the year with no ride at all. A purported big dollar sponsor turned out to be a sham. But finally, he assembled a deal with veteran owner Max Rogers from near Cedar Rapids, Iowa. They showed up in primer at Big H in Houston. But the important thing was the big three were back. Swindell had 152 outlaw wins and two championships back in the early 80s. Wolfgang ranked third in all-time wins with 100. But both would soon add to their totals. Had Sammy returned to the sprinters exclusively? Well, no, not really. You know, we just, uh, we'd plan on running the sprint car some, and uh, we're trying some new things, and uh, so it's been working good for us, you know. Uh, we, the things that we've been doing have, um, you know, went together real good. The car's been fast, and, uh, you know, it's just like it's always been, really. 
so strong when you come out this year. You and Max really had a good thing going at the end of 88 when you ran together. Uh, how long is your deal going to last this year? How much are you going to run? I don't know. He has never run that much, and uh, I got a knack for getting fired, so you never know. <laughs> I like to race against Steve and Sammy most because I've raced against them more so than anybody else in, uh, that, you know, in sprint car racing. We've been racing together since about 76 or 7, and uh, uh, I, just, I just like to race with them. I know they try hard and give it everything they got, and, and I admire that. So the 20th century outlaws rode into the traditional Old West, Texas and Oklahoma, with a full gang. Steve, what do you think? Well, I've been in gunfights with them since 78, so uh, I don't think anything's going to be any different. Well, the eight shooters were drawn at Big H in Houston. Uh, there is Steve Kinzer and the white number 11 being chased by Sammy Swindell. Lose a little bit of the bite coming out of turn number two. Can you see him? Can you hear him at that point? Well, at this point, I'm trying to get by Stevie Smith, uh, which allows me to get by him. And I go back up here. He gets back by me, slides up and loose stuff, and I get back by him. It's like racing on ice, isn't it? It was. Uh, you know, at that point, we went ahead and won the race. And I think right here we are probably down at North De uh, Dallas at, uh, in Texas. So, uh, And this is one of my weekends that didn't turn out very well. So you can pretty well see Sammy's uh, looks like he's leading this race right now. And he's behind Steve Beitler. And here comes Wolfie right behind him. Now, watch. This is an interesting study in a couple of outlaws squaring off against each other. They're both trying to get by Steve Beitler. Sometimes you can't pull off the split like this. You have to really trust the guy you're passing. Well, they both had a nice run at him, and, and it worked out well for both of them. Steve Kinzer pulls off the racetrack here, which is something very unusual. Why did you leave? No, I uh, basically had a good starting spot on the third row, missed a setup, uh, the gumbo come back on the inside, and my car didn't want to do anything but turn over. So uh, I fought it and fought it, and uh, we got a lap down there, and I just pulled it in. Meanwhile, back on the track, the two old adversaries left, Doug Wolfgang on the left, Sammy Swindell on the right, and Wolfgang held on and came home the victor in this preliminary feature. Here we are lining up for Saturday night's main in the traditional four abreast, and at this point, everybody's sort of looking the track over and uh, figuring out where they're going to run at it. Uh, I think everybody pretty well figures that, that the track is going to be on the bottom of the race. As you see, here Stevie Smith comes out in the lead off the bottom, uh, which is, well, we got a little tangle up here. Everybody's, Big tangle. <laughs> yeah, everybody gets straightened out, and uh, uh, the race goes ahead. There's not a yellow, doesn't bring it back out. Uh, Stevie Smith in a 77 car still leading. There's Doug Wolfgang. Sammy underneath him can't quite keep the front end down. There's Joe Gertie coming on the outside. Danny Smith running on the, in the white 56 car down below him. Tries to get underneath Sammy. Can't quite make it. Sammy gets back down in the bottom. All very close quarters and on a track like this, it's perfection that is required. You have to stay right down on the bottom. Well, it, well at this point, we got a yellow coming out. So. Uh, I, I think uh, I think at this point this is right here on the restart. Doug picks the gas up. Sammy gets by him on the inside, so he's got the line. Eh, got a little touch and go there, and, <laughs> and away they go. And uh, Sammy uh, shakes his fist at Doug and expresses his uh, disappointment over the way he was treated. Tulsa, Oklahoma, one of America's oil cities, seems appropriate to race cars, where over 50 showed up for the racing action here tonight, the second largest car count of the year. Now, in one of the preliminaries, Greg Hodnett spins in turns three, and along comes 17-year-old Jason Earls with no place to go. He destroys his car, gets upside down, although he was not injured. Now, here was the start of the preliminary. I come down here, get pinch it off, get into the front tires of the ground, and... You see what happens after that. Uh, now, you and Sammy and uh, Doug all escaped and left all this behind you. <laughs> well, we were sort of trying to battle for a little track <laughs> positions when the red come out. Uh, I think on the restart, Sammy had a flat tire, so he had to go to the tail. And uh, here we go with uh, Dave Blaney leading the, leading the race. Gets a little bit high. I think that allows uh, Wolfie and me both to slip by there. And I'm leading the race uh, from there on out, I think. Uh, now, we, we continue running, Doug closes in. I don't think he's really quite this close, and here I am setting myself up for a little bit of a showboat routine here. <laughs> We've which, seen this before, Steve. Yes, which <laughs> just about cost me the race. I come out, want to do a little wheel stand, and then they have to let it back down, <laughs> which Doug almost gets by me. So I don't know if I'll be pulling that trick again. It does point out one thing. 
those cars will light up the tires anywhere at any time in the racetrack. On those shorter, on those shorter tracks with the gear ratio and the horsepower they got, uh, you can do it. And, and that, track, uh, that track was pretty heavy and, and was easy to get it up there. Now watch the black number one, Sammy Swindell. Evidence that even the strong and the brave go down every once in a while. Bobby Allen starts this rollover with Sammy Swindell. Swindell amazingly comes back, repairs the car in the same race to the, the delight and the disapproval, both in the crowd at the same time. Swindell did not qualify for the main event through his preliminary. He did come back and make it through the B main. At the start of the main this night, a fireworks display showing how the people out in Oklahoma appreciate their sprint car racing. Well, here we're starting. It uh, uh, looks like Dave Blaney uh, again has uh, jumped out in the front of this race. Uh, there Johnny Herrera gets under him. I think Dave comes back, looks like right here, uh, and goes on. And I think Dave uh, pretty well leads this race uh, for a little bit. And I don't know, uh, finally Doug sort of catches in some lap cars, I think, and sort of goes right up in the rough stuff. I think coming up maybe in this corner and goes around him on the outside. So I just got up there and just he got stuck behind the lap car and I could tell even though he didn't get he, even though he got stuck behind the lap car I could tell that I was you know I could keep my speed up better so I just from there on stayed up just 10 hours later 100 miles down the road a typical overnight haul for the outlaws in the shadows of downtown Oklahoma City there is Mark Kinzer winner of the Tums Dash he will start on the pole in the main event today and if he had a rearview mirror he could see that Sammy Swindell is right there who knows if he would be able to hold back that many times champion. Always at Oklahoma City, among the biggest crowds in sprint car racing. Main event, Steve. Well, Mark uh, jumps into the lead here. Of course, Sammy's right, right behind him. I, I think Sammy uh, does get by him here in a little bit and leads most of the race. Uh, as you can see, we got a little bit of dust, a typical daytime a thing. A little bit of dust. <laughs> right here, Sammy gets by him, heats it, gets the tar just a little bit warm. We don't know if that'll come back and hurt anything later on. Maybe it was the tire, maybe it was horsepower, maybe it was just plain old-fashioned sprint car driving. Whatever, Mark Kinzer went on to win. Local drivers turning back the outlaws is unusual, but Steve, I guess some of the Western drivers have not been reading those headlines. One, Dan Hamilton, actually said quick time at Oklahoma City after his first two laps were disqualified. Are, as a group, they getting closer? Well, uh, I think uh, I think are getting closer. It's good. It's good for a, a race fan to, to see the locals come in there and and really be competitive uh, when the World of Outlaws come in. It's it's pretty nice that uh, they can come in and get the same equipment and the same motors as as we can uh, these days. So uh, that makes it that makes it a lot closer. Here is a montage of some of the top names who have been uh, challenging the Outlaws this year. In addition to Hamilton, what names jump out at you as potential winners on the trail? Well, uh, you know, as me, I always want to go back and, uh, and lean back toward uh, the, the younger World of Outlaw guys that's running uh, your Mark Kenzers, uh, your Stevie Smiths, and things like that. But uh, it's, it's early in the season, and I haven't got to see all the locals yet. So let's, let's, uh, let's hope uh, there's some going to come in right in here and, and win some of these races. It's very difficult to do that. You know, there was a time in racing where people who competed at a local track were invincible. But now, you guys, the traveling pros, are. Well, I think what, what helps us is we get to set our cars up so many different race tracks. Uh, and a lot of these tracks is, is tracks that, that is not strange tracks to us. Uh, we pretty well run the same schedule year to year base, so it's not like we're coming into new tracks every time. We've been to those tracks at least once or maybe twice a year. But it is dirt, so the setup from the last visit doesn't really mean too much, does it? Well, it doesn't mean that much. Uh, it probably helps us as much as it uh, hurts the local guys. Uh, like I said, any time you got Mother Nature playing a, a factor in, in your race uh, conditions, uh, it's a little bit different. And, and that's, that's what makes dirt racing so competitive. But as long as there is an outlaw trail, there will be posses chasing after you. The Tums Dash winner at Big H was Stevie Smith Jr., something he's done already three times this season. Now, despite the enormous promise that he shows, one rumor had him just clinging to his Al Hamilton ride. But Steve, he's looked strong enough to me to keep his job. Well, uh, I certainly hope there's no truth in that rumor, but uh, I think they've did a tremendous job, uh, Al Hamilton and Stevie Smith Jr. I think that the whole team has nothing to be ashamed about. Uh, I tell you what, uh, this sprint car racing, uh, it's like any other type of racing. It's tough. Uh, when you got those veterans in there that's uh, used to winning those races and you come in as a young kid and for the first three or four years, it's just, it's just hard to come in there and start uh, making yourself consistent up there. And he has done that. And let's, let's hope that team stays together. He is another second generation driver. His father, Stevie Smith Sr., was 
From time to time, unbeatable in the Hanover, Pennsylvania area. Stevie had a tough time this night. You can see him bicycling all over the racetrack, but uh, he's been oh so close to winning a main event. Well, these type of tracks here, when the right rear is hooked up hard, are really hard type of track to drive. But uh, I think he's going to start figuring all these setups out and be one of your best. Two years ago, Memphis's Bobby Davis Jr. was on top of the sprint car world, outlaw champ. True, Sammy and Steve didn't run the full season, but unfortunately for Davis, he did have his fastest year. He might have been racy with the big three, but we'll never know. Performance has since tailed off, and when the team temporarily lost crew chief Kenny Woodruff to triple bypass surgery, Davis used that moment to quit the team. Well, you know, sprint car racing has been really excellent for me, and, uh, you know, we enjoy it right now, and, um, you know, so sometime down the road we'd like to do some other type of racing. Right at the moment, it seems like uh, whatever good opportunity would come up, you know, with the cart cars or the, you know, the Indy cars, uh, looks like to me the NASCAR is the way to go right now. Uh, you know, get a Bush Grand National ride and maybe work with that for a couple of years and uh, try to get in a Winston Cup ride. Uh, that's what we'd really be pushing for and uh, trying to do right now. Both team and driver say they'll be back, but not together. Recall, this is the only Ford-powered sprinter at this level. Well, let's hope uh, that Bobby Davis uh, gets him a team, whether he puts it together with himself or somebody else, and uh, let's hope that uh, the Luna team gets back out on the circuit, and, and maybe all this will come up with two teams instead of just one team. Davis did make this appearance two weeks ago in Ohio in the Ohio-based Dan Murphy car. He actually won his heat and ran close to the top five, but says that was only temporary. He is working on his own project. Back at Gore Racing in Indianapolis, where they field everything from sprint cars to Indianapolis cars. We are reviewing the World of Outlaw season to date, and Steve Kinzer, leading points again, has joined us. You know, rules are the critical factor for the survival of any racing organization. The most important aspect of that, safety and cost. Ted Johnson, the president of the World of Outlaws, has announced changes for 1992, apparently to stem the spiraling cost of engines. Steve? Is he guarding the right-hand house? Well, I don't know uh, as far as the cost. Uh, from what I've found out about it, any time you put uh, rules on engine costs, somehow the development and everything else just, just runs it back up that more. What would be the best approach to cutting overall cost? Well, I think uh, uh, probably the only approach I would know, uh, I don't know if I'd really want to bring up uh, is, uh, some of the edges. I'd say probably your, the only way to go around is maybe cutting cost uh, right off the bat, I would say, is have a, a weight limit on the race cars. And I would think that would cut more cost on a, on a sprint car than anything. Uh, uh, of course, again, you're looking at the brakes here and they're wanting to get away with the carbon fiber brakes, uh, which is a tremendous cost on these things. And, and again, if you've got a weight rule in it, you don't need carbon fiber brakes. Do you do too much traveling? Well, I, you know, I, the traveling's part of the sport. Uh, if we're going, if we're going to run two and three nights a week and and and, and get around to the people, the, the traveling's part of it. Uh, uh, you know, it's easy for a driver to sit here and say that because uh, he doesn't do all the work on the cars and prepare the cars. Uh, he gets to strap himself in it and and uh, either get an airplane and fly to the next race or get in his motor home and have his wife and family drive him to the next race. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, you need to talk more of a car owner's uh, standpoint than, than a driver's standpoint. Uh, when you get to talk about costs, you're talking to the wrong guy talking to me. Steve, you once told me that among all the racetracks that you travel to each year, the Eldora Speedway in Western Ohio is one very special place. At least without exaggeration, or is this true, to call it the fastest track of its kind in the world? Well, I think Eldor is the fastest track. Uh, any, you know, it's probably the highest banked track uh, all the way around the track. Even the straightaways are banked on it. So, uh, so you run around there just a little less than 14 seconds, I think, uh, 1382. So, it's 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 definitely fast. Tell us what the basic philosophy is in steering one of these 750 horsepower plus cars around here. Uh, wide open. <laughs> no, you, what actually what you want to do is you want to run these cars actually wide open around the track. Uh, basically, you want to let the wind on the sideboards of the tr car pull the car down to the left a little bit and just sort of lay on those and not let the car lay down very as hard, 
hard enough for the scrub a lot of speed and, and just keep, a, keep it right up against that cushion and just sort of bring it right on around. So you really drive the car with the wing then, don't you? Well, you do. It, you know, it is a little bit of a crutch when you're running around these things. Uh, it's not like without a wing where you're really on the right rear hard. Uh, the sideboards do uh, take a lot of the force off of the right rear tire and puts it back on the left rear of the car. The official record set by Sammy Swindell two weeks ago, now 130. No matter how race-wise or callous a particular driver is, every race at Eldora really demands their attention. Let's take a look at that recent Saturday night. This is Joe Gertie in a heat race with uh, Johnny Rare behind him. Joe Gertie's one of the young drivers in the, in the past two years that's uh, really uh, come a long way in the, in the world of outlaws. Uh, so there you see Dave Blaney's blow the motor in the heat race. And, I think we'll see later on in the night when he comes back and uh, gets this motor uh, changed and, and comes back and runs. Here is the start of the Tums Dash, almost six wide. Look at this as the cars come off of turn number four. And in this particular case, the start was everything. Johnny Herrera of Albuquerque, New Mexico streaks out first. And because there are only so few laps in one of these dashes, he goes on to the victory. There you see Johnny winning for the first time the race of speed for the night at a World of Outlaw Sprint Car Race. The start of the B main event, though. Coming off of corner number four, the start in trouble is Paul Lotier. That's Brett Mann going into the outside wall very hard. Lotier over. No one injured, but uh, a lot of hurt and singed feelings at the start of that when you can see all of the drivers exiting their cars. The cars may look very crumpled, Steve, but those roll cages really do their job. Well, the cage has probably been the, the most safest thing they've ever put on a race car as far as safety. And uh, here's Mark uh, leading, leading this B-Main, and, and they said he was turning times of 13 nines uh, in the B-Main, so that's pretty fast uh, running around there. So the A-Main lines up with everyone thinking about those 130 mile per hour laps that Mark Kinzer was turning in the B-Main. We get a green flag, and Sammy Swindell darts out into the lead. There you see me and Danny Smith in the 56 car running, uh, I don't know, we're back third, fourth, fifth, somewhere in there, I can't remember at this time. Uh, there's Sammy uh, going through some lap cars. Uh, I think when we come in here, look at look right here, what happens here? Front the, wing. The air catches the front wing and uh, just crushes it down. Tremendous air pressure being exerted by not only the huge wings above the cockpit, but also across the front axle. Now, there's Doug Wolfgang. Wolfgang begins to close in on Sam. It begins apparent that he's got a problem. He's doing too much bouncing. Well, it looks like he's losing a little air in his right rear tire. And, and any time your right rear starts going down, it's not going to be long before he's out of the race. Uh, he's still bouncing around. Uh, and Doug's going to go on by. and. and I think you'll see in a few laps that uh, Sammy will no longer be there. The sparks are a sign that that car is sitting down on the ground. Obviously, one of the tires, one of the corners of the car is sitting down to the surface. Wolfgang, at this point, looks like he has a pretty clear open track. And here is Swindell, yes, with the right rear tire disintegrated, as you can see him limping into the pits. Okay, uh, here comes the yellow flag out. So, I, uh, best I can remember, we have a restart, and there's not a whole lot of laps left in this race. Uh, uh, I think Doug goes on and pretty well uh, takes the race from here. Now, what is the difference between a race like this, Steve, and one that you dominate at this place? Well, uh, the difference is uh, right now Doug Wolfgang has <laughs> got this race dominated. Well, Doug Wolfgang talks about his victory at Eldora. When we pushed off, I was going to sell for fourth or better, whatever I could run comfortably without without abusing the car to the bitter end, because really the, the big deal is tomorrow afternoon. If you ruin your car tonight, it's no good then. So, uh, you know, and I, I, these cars are lightweight and super fast, a lot of horsepower, and they just, they really ain't made to be bouncing like that. Back in Indianapolis, Larry Newber and Steve Kinzer, you know the outlaws will gallop across Indiana, Steve's home in May, as well as Pennsylvania, where their stiffest local competition awaits. But Steve, the toughest opponent has been the weather so far this year. Well, it's springtime. Uh, it's going to rain some, but uh, we'd rather see the rain come uh, early in the week and let the, let the weekends be nice. And uh, right now we've had the opposite. It's uh, been nice early in the week, and it seems like every weekend, uh, about Thursday, here it comes. Well, they're calling Ted Johnson the world's greatest current rainmaker. He's even broken the drought in California. Well, that's true. Uh, it did happen. Uh, they was in quite some drought, and uh, we made it rain. 
The outlaws are always on the trail, and Prime Network will be riding along in 1991. For Steve Kinzer, I'm Larry Newber. And in case you're listening, we've already had our quota of rain for the year. So long. <laughs>